Hallelujah. Last week, we looked at the promises contained in the Abrahamic covenant. And there were five minor promises, there were three bigger ones, and one mega promise. All contained in one covenant. Now, that was a major point in history, and it's affected billions of people since then. And it still impacts us today. How? It reminds us and reinforces that our God is a promise-keeping God. He doesn't forget. Things don't just slip his mind. He recalls every promise that he has ever made. He keeps every promise that he has ever made. And for you and I, that is incredible news because if you are a follower of Jesus here today, as Paul shouts in 2 Corinthians 1.20, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. You are an heir of the promises and God's going to keep them. But there are a few other things about this covenant that God made with Abraham that we need to look at and understand. Now, I've mentioned before that God has instilled Trinity into his creation because God is triune in nature. And in this covenant, it's no different. There are three legs to this covenant, three pillars that hold up this covenant before God. And today we're going to examine those pillars. So let me take you back to an incredible moment in the life of Abraham. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 15. We are going to look at the entire chapter this morning. So if, if you were wondering if you were going to get your Bible reading in today, I guarantee it. <laughs> Genesis chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant of my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it, it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land and take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. And Abram brought all of these to him and cut them in two and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. And when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking firepot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And everybody said, Gesundheit. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, this morning, this, this covenant, this picture that we see here, it's not like something we're used to. It's outside of our experience. And Lord, it matters because you've got it in your word, but we honestly, we don't have anything in our experience to relate to it. So would you open our eyes because Holy Spirit, you put it here for us to learn from. You put it here for it to matter to us today. So reveal your word to us and bring it alive in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an incredible moment in history. 
And we actually have archaeological verification that ceremonies just like this one actually happened. This is not some made-up scenario. This is an accurate description of a covenant ceremony that can be verified in history. And this scene holds so much truth for us today, and it shows us the three pillars of the covenant. And the first one is this. The covenant is eternal. Turn back to Genesis 13, verses 14 to 17 with me, because there we read this. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had departed from him, look around from where you are to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, all the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. And then in Genesis 17, 7, it says, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. I want you to listen to the phrasing. God uses words like forever and everlasting. And Hebrews 6, 18 tells us it is impossible for God to lie. And that is supported by two other passages in Scripture, Numbers 23, 19, and Titus 1, 2. Why do I do that? I had somebody ask me that the other day. Why do you use so many Bible verses when you're preaching? Scripture verifies Scripture. Amen. It's not my word, it's God's word. Jesus said, let everything be verified by two or three witnesses. Okay? Please, test me up here. Don't take everything I say for granted. If I make a mistake, it's because I'm human. It's not because God screwed up. But you stand on what God says, not on what I say. All right? God doesn't lie. He also doesn't exaggerate. Okay? Jesus never went up to Peter and went, Hey, Peter, guess what? I caught a fish that was like this big. This big. Okay? We do that. He doesn't. <laughs> we tend to exaggerate. God doesn't. Okay? So when he says forever, he means forever. When he says everlasting, he means everlasting. And even within the covenant, the elements are promised forever. In Genesis 13, 15, God says, all the land that, I, that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. And when Abraham was 99 years old, in Genesis 13, or 17, 8, God said, the whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. In other words, the land belongs to Israel forever. And also hiding in Genesis 13 says, all the land I, you see I will give to you and your offspring is the promise that nationhood would remain forever. Other nations have disappeared over time, but Israel has remained a people. Where are the Babylonians today? Where are the Assyrians today? Where are the Medes or the Persians today? But Israel still is. God made an everlasting covenant with Abraham, and he will not see that unfulfilled. Eternity is one of the pillars of the covenant. The second pillar is this. The covenant is unconditional. This one is huge. How many of you recall being at a wedding? Okay. You remember the bride walking down the aisle? You remember the groom standing at the altar trying to look excited, but really he was just really nervous because he didn't honestly think she was going to say, I do? You, bring, you can bring to mind the, the dress and the flowers and so many of the details, but let's talk vows for a moment. Do you remember the vows? Often you hear the traditional ones where the people say, I, beast, take you, beauty, to be my lawfully wedded wife. To love and to cherish, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death takes me, until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we see things like that take place, and we don't really pay attention because, well, we're too used to it. Two people making commitments to the other with God and man as witness, the groom says, blah, blah, blah. And we read into the ceremony that really what the groom is saying is, blah, 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 as long as you, blah, blah, blah. And the bride does the same thing, but that's not what's being said. What is being said is, blah, 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 no matter what. And because we read conditions into our ceremonies, we actually create loopholes and escape hatches for us to get out of them. But that's the difference between God 
making a covenant and the ones we make. God's covenant was one-sided. God isn't letting himself get out of this one. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, this is where we dig into Genesis chapter 15. In the first five verses where Abram is told, I am your shield, your very great reward. And Abram basically goes on and starts whining. I don't have any kids. My wife is getting old. Yeah, life is just so unfair. And God goes, stop. Go outside and look at the stars. I'm going to do this. And Abram believed him. Now, that's great. You know, that's great when you're 25. That's great when you're 30. But when you hit 75 and God says, I'm going to make you as mul uh, multiply you as much as this, you kind of got to go, right. But that's not what Abram did. Abram went outside and said, God, you said it, so you're going to do it. And then we encounter what's known as the covenant ceremony. God told them to bring a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon, and, and cut them in half. This was what is known as a blood covenant. And according to history, the way it would work is this. They would cut the animals in half on either side of an aisle. And the two people that were making the covenant would walk together down this aisle between these carcasses as if to say, may this happen to me if I break this covenant. But unlike the historical covenants, in verse 12, we're told that once the animals were laid out, the Lord put Abram to sleep. Now, why would God do this? Why would God put one of the two participants to sleep? Well, the answer is, there's not two participants here. God was making this a one-sided covenant. Why? Because God knew that we couldn't keep it. God knew that Abraham and his descendants couldn't keep their side of the covenant, so he doesn't include them. Instead, Abram saw a fire pot and a torch go between the carcasses. Both of those, smoke and fire, are symbols of God's presence, and they pass down the pathway. God was saying that his promises, the covenant, was not dependent on the actions or the faithfulness or the lack of faithfulness of Abraham's children. This is a move of sovereign grace and mercy. God refused to put a loophole for himself into the covenant. He gave us a way out, but he locked himself in. God was saying that his promises are forever. This was an unconditional covenant. God marked out borders for the land. God promised to increase Abraham's family. God promised, God promised, God promised. And all of them were based on him, not on anything that Abraham had to do. Now, maybe you're confused by this. Maybe you're not understanding what I'm trying to say, because very honestly, we do not do one-sided anything. Okay? We, we really just, we don't get it. So let me put it another way. 2 Chronicles 7.14, we're very familiar with this verse. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. How many of you know this verse? How many of you have quoted this verse? Okay. This is what is known as a dependent promise. If God's people do this, then God will do this. But the covenant with Abraham went like this. I will do this and this and this. There's no if. There's no if-then aspect to this covenant. God will act no matter how the children of Abraham act. Being unconditional is the second pillar of this covenant. And the final pillar is this one. The covenant is inheritable. Knowing that the stars of the sky are innumerable, God knew that for the covenant to be established and to eventually become fulfilled, there needed to be a direct line of the covenant to be passed down. He also knew that Abraham was going to have a lot of kids. How many of you know that Abraham had more than one son? He had Isaac, he had Ishmael, and he had how many more? Abram had multiple children. After Sarah died, he married again a woman named Keturah, and he had five more sons. 
okay? So although, actually he had eight sons, I take that back. He knew that Abram was gonna have all these kids, but only one was gonna be the recipient of the covenant. Now today the Muslim people would say that Abram's, Abraham's son Ishmael was that recipient, but that's not what scripture says. Genesis 17 verses 18 to 21 says this. Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing, and God said yes. But your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful. I will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. Abraham wanted to see his son Ishmael blessed, and God agreed to it. But God was not going to establish a faith-based covenant with a son born through an act of unfaithfulness. Isaac was the son of promise, miraculously born when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. Okay, Sarah was changing diapers and collecting social, social security at the same time. Okay, and then in the very next generation, we see God narrow it again. In Genesis 28, 13 to 15, God chooses Jacob over his twin brother Esau. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed but through you and your offspring. This is to Jacob. I will be with you and watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Now this choice is huge for us today, but most of the time we don't even see the importance of it. God made this promise to Jacob right after he had deceived his father and stolen from his brother. He ran away as a thief and a liar and encountered the covenant-keeping God. Now this flies in the face of everything we think. Tell me something. When do you think you are more likely to encounter God? When you are walking in holiness or when you are walking in sin? No, church answer would be when you're walking in holiness. But that's not what happened with Jacob. And the reason, you see, why would God show up to this thief and a liar? Remember the covenant? It's not based on the actions of Abraham's children. God saw the heart of Jacob and he chose him over Esau. And from Jacob came 12 sons. And in Genesis 49.10, God declared, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation shall be his. Even though we think that Joseph, the multicolored jacket boy, should have been the one to inherit, God chose Judah. And later, from the tribe of Judah, God chose the unknown family of Jesse, and then the youngest son, David. Why does this matter? Well, you see, Jesus is the seed of the covenant. And this was how God ensured that his son was identified as a son of David. To be the Christ, you had to be from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, and David. But to be a recipient of the covenant promises, you had to be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now listen again to the very final line of that promise to Jacob. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now wait a minute, Sean. Doesn't that line mean that God is a liar? Because Jacob died in Egypt, not in the promised land. Jacob only had 70 descendants, and he never saw all the nations blessed. How is this a finished promise? It isn't. Hebrews 11.13 says all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. These promises that God made are yet to come promises. And for them to be fulfilled, here's the kicker, folks. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have to rise again to receive and see the fulfillment of those promises. That is huge. You and I may not live to see all of the promises fulfilled that God makes to us. 
But we will live again. We will rise again. We will receive them and we will see them fulfilled. This God that we serve does not see death as a nullifier of a covenant. He sees death as a hurdle, not an end. Isn't that incredible? Being inheritable is the third pillar of this covenant. Okay, so what? I mean, come on, Sean, that was like 3,000 years ago. Who cares? So what if it's eternal? What, so what if it's unconditional? And so what if it's inheritable? How does that impact me? How does that affect me today? Well, being eternal means that God doesn't ever forget. Now, that's great news for you if you have made the decision to be a part of his family. It's not good news if you're still hoping to get into heaven in your own strength. And what do I mean by that? Well, God doesn't forget until he chooses to forget. And for those who have come into the family of Jesus, he says this in Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. In Hebrews 8, 12, he says, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. And in Hebrews 10, 17, he promised that their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. A lady was in a church one day, and she'd been a, an attending member for many, many years, and she went to the pastor, and she said, I believe God has given me the gift of prophecy. Well, the pastor was skeptical. So he said to her, I want you to go home and pray. I want you to go home and ask God what sin I committed when I was in seminary. We're going to just see if you really do have the gift of prophecy. And she, okay, fine. So she went home and started praying. And three weeks later, she came back to service, and the pastor approached her and said, So, did God give you an answer? She goes, Yes. He looks at her and says, What sin did I commit in seminary? She said, That's exactly what God said. What sin? It's under the blood, brother. Why do you remember your sins when God doesn't? Why do you let the enemy remember your sins when God doesn't? Our covenant is eternal. And that means that Satan doesn't get a chance, he doesn't get a moment, he doesn't get to interrupt. It's eternal. It's unbroken. My God says that he remembers your sins no more. So that means it's done. It's under the blood. When the enemy goes, uh, but Brian, you go, uh-uh, there's nothing there. You go right ahead and say it, but it's not there. You go and talk to Jesus. I don't remember my sin anymore. If he remembers, I guess I've got to account for it, but if he doesn't remember, then you know what? You just, there's the door. Get out and don't let the door hit you on, your, on the way out. Just, just go. Get out. That is great news for the believer. But for those trying to get into heaven by being a good person or doing their best or trying to earn God's love, he says this in Ecclesiastes 7.20, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Romans 3.10 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. And as for the stuff that we do in our life, Hosea 7.2 reminds us, They do not realize that I remember all their evil deeds. Their sins engulf them, and they are always before me. In Matthew 12, 36, Jesus says, I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. That's bad news if you're trying to do life and trying to get into heaven your way. You know, Frank Sinatra had that song, I did it my way. That's a real bad song for people to sing in front of the Lord who remembers everything. I'd rather be singing the song, I did it your way. You know, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. God doesn't forget until he chooses to forget. And the only thing that makes him choose to forget is when a person surrenders to Jesus. For the person rejecting or refusing Jesus, God remembers every word, every action, every thought, every motive of the heart. And Revelation speaks of a day when books will be opened and they will all be laid bare and we have to give an account for those things. What a horrible day that will be. What an awesome day it will be for those of us that have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. 
being unconditional, however, means that your actions don't impact God's decisions. No, no, I'm not talking eternal security here. I'm not talking go and do whatever you want, go and sin if you want. I'm not talking about that. It means that God knows that you have given your life to him and he will save you. Yes, we strive not to sin anymore, but our salvation is not dependent on our actions after we give our lives to Jesus. What does that mean? It means, Rod, that if you smack your thumb with a hammer and you say something you shouldn't, you're not going to hell. Because my God, when he died on the cross, died for past sins, present sins, and future sins. It means that my God has got it covered. It means that my God is big enough to keep me in the palm of his hand and nobody is able to get me out of it. That's what being unconditional is all about. Your bad language isn't dependent or doesn't impact your salvation. Should you quit? Yeah, you should. But not because you're trying to earn God's love. It's because of how much God has loved you. You should try to please him. Not trying to earn a place in heaven now. You're trying to act out of that place of heaven now. Your adoption doesn't get nullified when you screw up. God is bigger than that, and he's better than that. And that is great news. You can rest in his loving arms and stop trying to prove that you deserve his love. You don't. He knows it, you know it, and your actions for good or not don't change that. And being inheritable, oh my goodness, that means that God has room at his table for one more. Amen. It means that you and I, who are not physical descendants of Abraham, we can get in. It means we can pass this down to our kids. How? By teaching them about Jesus. It doesn't mean they will believe. That's their choice. But if your children and your children's children act in faith, they too can receive the promises and not just the blessings from God. This is how it impacts you. But here is an even more important way that it impacts you. In Ephesians 1.5, the Apostle Paul says this, He, God, predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. What this means is this, it's only through Jesus that you and I as non-Jews could be adopted into the family of God. We are not of the line of Abraham. We're not of the line of Isaac. We're not of the line of Jacob. Naturally, we don't have a claim or a hope for the blessings or the covenant of God. But through Jesus, we do. Amen. And this is the key. Jesus is the eternal, unconditional, inheritable seed of the promise to Abraham. This is why Jesus could say with absolute authority in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the eternal one. He offers unconditional salvation to any who come to him. He is the reason we get to inherit the promises. Only through Jesus do we have forgiveness, hope, and salvation. Do you know him? Have you given your life to him? Or are you trying to earn? Are you trying to work your way? Are you trying to chip away at the list of sins that are stored up in those books? I got news for you. You don't have a hope with that. What's your earliest memory? Age five? Age four? I've got a couple of memories from when I was like two, I think, two or three, but that's about it. But my parents tell me that one of the first words I learned was, no! <laughs> You were sinning before you even knew what sin was. You don't even remember half of the things that you have done. But God remembers all of them. Do you know him? Because you can't wipe away the things you don't remember. You can't eliminate the debt that you don't even know about. But God can. And he offers it to you today. So let's pray. Father, this morning, every day we should be renewing our vows. 
not just to our spouse, but to our God. You renew them every day to us, Father. Your word says your mercies are new every morning. And we receive those mercies and we rejoice in those mercies, but God, how often do we renew our vows to you? Your word says that we, like sheep, have gone astray. Bring us back, Lord. Bring us back. Holy Spirit, set us on fire again. Anoint us with your power. Anoint us with your fire. Anoint us with your passion. Anoint us with your life. Anoint us with your hope. Anoint us with your forgiveness again. Because we do go astray. And Father, we forget the richness and the glory of, of the promises you've made to us. And sometimes, God, we even outright say no to them. In those moments, Father, when temptation seems so strong, sometimes we make that mistake and we just say, you know what? I give in. I thank you that the covenant that you have made with us, the new covenant, is not dependent on our actions. It's dependent on Jesus. And Lord, I just pray right now that if there's anyone here today that has not made that step to give their life to Jesus, they would do it now. If that's you, just slip your hand up. God sees, but I want to be able to pray for you. Or maybe you've gone and done it your way. Maybe you've figured that, you know what, th th this Christian life is just too hard and I'm just going to do it my way. How's that working out for you? Jesus said, I am the life. When we turn away from the life, we only walk in death. So God, forgive us for that and help us to walk in life. Search our hearts, oh God. Is there someone we haven't forgiven? Is there something we're holding on to? Is there anger that we're holding on to? Is there bitterness that we're latched on to? Is there a grudge that we're keeping? Help us to lay those things down because they poison our souls and they put a wall up between us and you. So God, have your way in us this morning. Have your way in us. And draw people to yourself. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Could I ask you to stand with me this morning? In just a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask Pastor Colton to come up, and he's been looking forward to this day to reveal the kids' ministry to all of y'all. And I'm just stalling to make sure that the people that we strategically placed in different places to uh, accomplish certain tasks and to do those things are actually able to get them done. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you to rest in the arms of Jesus this week. To trust him to have you. To stop trying to earn his love. You already have it. To stop trying to be better than you are, but instead to let him make you better than you are. I told a, a gentleman in our service a couple of weeks ago, I said, you don't clean up your life to draw close to Jesus. You draw close to Jesus and he will clean up your life. I want to challenge you to do that this morning and this week. Draw close to him. Maybe you spend half an hour a day in devotions. Try approaching it a little bit different. Spend half an hour just writing a love letter to the Lord. Thanking him for things that he's done. Praising him for things that he's doing. Fall in love with the Lord again. And for those of you that are married in this room, fall in love with your spouse again. It's not too late. They dated you. <laughs> they said I do. They made that choice. Now you have to make that choice to keep trying. How many of us guys are guilty? I caught her. I no, it's like the old Swedish man. His wife comes up and goes, why don't you ever tell me you love me? He looks at him and goes, I told you on the day we got married that I love you. If something changes, I'll let you know. 
No! Tell your spouse you love them. You may not always like them, but <laughs> love them! May God strengthen you this week. May he open your eyes to the spiritual reality of the firm hand in which you are held. May he help your heart to realize how deeply loved you are. May he give you an awareness of how clean the slate is. And may he help you to realize that when he thinks of you, he smiles. He rejoices over you with dancing. He sings over you. We don't believe it, but it's right there in Scripture. So may God make it a reality in your life this week.